By the time Lane Staley passed away, the Alice in Chains singer was physically and emotionally crippled by his drug Hello, addiction. Hello, everybody! Noah so Farrow, your favorite bipolar actor, and what we are getting into today is Lane's final days as told by grunge. So, without further ado, let's get on. Get on! By the time Lane Staley passed away, the Alice in Chains singer was physically and emotionally crippled by his drug addiction, so isolated that no publicly available pictures exist from this period. This is what the final 12 months of his life were like. According to Guitar World, in 1997, Lane Staley purchased an apartment in Seattle's bustling University District. This would be the singer's home for the next five years, leading up to his death. Yet, for the last year of his life, almost no one visited Staley in this apartment. I saw this performance. If you guys want to take a look at it, I just checked it out. This is actually the first Alice in Chains song, even though I came up during that time. Interestingly enough, I never caught my radar. First song I never listened to. Mwah! He rarely left. For the most part, Lane lived an incredibly private and insular life in the year leading up to his death. To the point where the few times people did see him, it was a notable event that they remembered vividly. According to a Facebook memorial post by early collaborator Tim Branham that was reprinted in Alternative Nation, in the end, almost no one could contact Lane. He wouldn't answer the door or take calls. He lived in a condo right smack in front of everyone in the university district. He weighed 80-some pounds, and his health was deteriorating. There were reports that he would go to Toys R Us to buy games and return home, but always by himself. It was well known that Lane Staley was a lover of video games and would often disappear to play games during Alice in Chains recording sessions. And so I'm going to go ahead and predict that this is heroin. It seems heroin-y. Ish. Even though I guess locked up in your no, because locked up in your place, yeah, that's that's definitely. Greg Prado's book Grunge is Dead. His mother Nancy described him as a video game freak, while Tad Doyle of the seminal Seattle band Tad describes how Alice in Chains would have his band on their tour bus, quote, playing video games and listening to music. However, like many of the things that seemed to make him happy, video games became an escape for Staley a way to focus his mind on something that didn't wear too hard on his emotions. In a Rolling Stone profile of the band, the writer described Lane disappearing to play games while his bandmates were playing a wild bumper car sport called Whirly Ball. There's a tr Imagine him alive today. He would be a gamer. He'd be making, like, T-Pain $60,000 a year. 56 grand an hour playing video games in your drawers. It's kind of hard wait, to get wait, me to go out to Gaming trope that rock stars overindulging in bad behavior and harmful drugs think they'll live forever. Not Lane Staley, though. By the end of his life, he was not only acutely aware that his drug use had screwed up his whole world, but that he wouldn't be around much longer. In his last interview, months before his death with Argentinian journalist Adriana Rubio, Staley admitted that he knew he was on his way out. He was quoted in the interview, later reprinted by MTV. I know I'm dying. I'm not doing well. Don't try to talk about this to my sister Liz. She will know it sooner or later. I know I'm near death. I did crack and heroin for years. I never wanted to end my life this way. I know I have no chance. It's too late. Perhaps the most painful thing about this is that Lane's <coughs> sense of hopelessness drove him to isolate even further and push away even those who loved him. He said in the interview, I know I did my best, or what I thought would be right. I changed my number. I don't want to see people anymore, and it's nobody's business but mine. Many outsiders looking in at the grunge scene claimed that the movement glamorized drug use, promoting the concept that art and addiction were intertwined via their lyrics and the growing concept of heroin chic that was popular in 90s fashion. But Lane Staley's final interview reveals that he was no longer using heroin for pleasure, but simply because he was so addicted to it that he couldn't possibly stop. He said in an interview published by Blabbermouth, this drug use is like the insulin a diabetic needs to survive. I'm not using drugs oh, to get wow. high, like many people think. Because of this, Staley was dis I like that. That parallel. It's like insulin to me now. It has changed me so much that now this drug is the thing that's keeping me alive. That's Shakespearean is sh disgusted by heroin's effect on his life. 
and that he didn't want Alice in Chains fans thinking it was cool, saying, By the way, very Howard Hughes situation where he locks himself up and nobody can get to him. Howard Hughes is a little different. It was dealing more with mental health issues than I don't think so much drugs versus drugs. But they are brothers in arms, ladies and gentlemen, drugs and mental health issues. Whether you start drugs because of mental health issues or 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 you have mental health issues, they seem to walk hand in hand when you're doing rehab, when you're going to get help for your problems. Yeah. The mind, man. I never wanted the public's thumbs up about this f***ing drug use. My liver is not functioning, and I'm throwing up all the time and f***ing my pants. The pain is more than you can handle. It's the worst pain in the world. Dope, sick, hurts the entire body. Perhaps closest to Lane Staley in the 12 months before his death was his mother, Nancy McCallum, who had always been there for her son and helped him seek out treatment for his addiction. Nancy was even working in a treatment center the day Staley died, and it was her intervention that led the police to find the singer's body. According to an interview she did with the Seattle Times, Nancy was working the front desk of a rehab clinic on the day that Lane passed away. She was even planning to meet with one of the supervisors there to map out a new line of treatment for her son. Then, she received a call from his accountant saying that Staley had taken out a large sum of money weeks ago and that no one had heard from him since. Nancy rushed to his apartment, and when Staley didn't answer, she contacted the police. In many ways, Nancy is still haunted by her son's addiction. Addicts and fans send her letters all the time, but she also sees Lane's lyrics on the subject as helpful and prophetic. She said, that's what his music was about, the life of an addict. He chose to write about it and sing about it and perform about it. It was a warning. We write about ourselves because we know about ourselves. As Lane Staley's health deteriorated, he became less interested in being social or recording with his band. That said, the people who saw him deep into his addiction claimed that while Staley looked terrible physically, he was often the same smiling, light-hearted guy they remember. According to an interview with Staley's stepfather Jim Elmer in David DeSola's book Alice in Chains, The Untold Story, Lane seemed to be in high spirits when around others, even toward the end of his life. He was smiling, he was talkative, so there's a good sign that either he was doing better. Okay, so this is a lot of, of parallels with, multi, with mental health, health as well. Now, I deal with a lot of mental health issues. <laughs> That's my introduction. And a lot of times you do that. This is a mask. This mask is because you feel guilty in so many ways that you don't want to take that guilt out on people that you love, the people around you. So, hey, I'm going to perk up. Hey, everything's okay. Everything's fine. Hey, hey, I want to lash out, but I can't. So, blah, 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 blah. Like, it's, it's it, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's the maskiest of all masks. It's the maskiest of all masks. Super mask, Mr. Bull or he was trying to do better, that there's a more hopeful thing as compared to we're going to lose him in two days or something like that. Jeff Gilbert, an editor at Seattle music magazine The Rocket, said that when Lane approached him on... I'll give you a prime example. A lot of times people uh, with mental health issues and when they've gone to the point where they can't do it anymore, people don't see it coming. Why? Because they are masking. They're smiling, they're still making jokes, having fun, and yet at the same time, they're at the brink. The street toward the end of his life, he looked bad physically, but seemed aware emotionally. He looked like an 80-year-old version of himself, and it was frightening. He still managed to smile. Every so often, you'd see that little glimmer. As Lane Staley became more and more engulfed by his addiction to heroin, Many of those around him began to see him as a withdrawn and tragic figure. But his family has warm and sweet memories from the last time they saw him alive. In a profile on Staley from the Seattle Times, Mother Nancy said that her final memory of her son was him holding his nephew while visiting his family in February 2002. She said, I saw Lane on Thanksgiving of 01 and again just around Valentine's Day when he came to see his sister's new baby. The last time I saw Lane, and the last picture we have of him is holding baby Oscar. Sadly for fans, this last image has never been shared with the public. However, Nancy makes a specific point. Like I said, I just saw that performance, the MTV performance, uh, and I didn't know anything about this band. Didn't know about the tragedy or drug issues. I could tell he was tortured. Like that, just being on stage, and that was 
the propped up sober version of enough, you know, sober enough to be presentable. That dude was fighting every day. Of mentioning that although her son had become withdrawn, he wasn't abandoned by those who loved him. He was never far from the love of his family and friends who filled his answering machine and mailbox with messages and letters. Just because he was isolated doesn't mean we didn't have sweet moments with him. Lane was actually planning to record guest vocals on a song with alternative meddlers Taproot for their 2002 album, Welcome. The band's unique sound, staccato rhythms, throbbing groove riffs, and alternating guttural and harmonized clean vocals made the album pretty perfect for a Lane Staley guest spot. And according to Alice in Chains, The Untold Story, Staley was enthusiastic about recording the vocals, though he asked that producer Toby Wright come alone because he, quote, wasn't looking or feeling great and he didn't want to be seen. Sadly, Staley's final vocal performance never got recorded, though he was interested in the project right up until his death. According to a statement by former Taproot drummer Jared Montague, Lane's mother told the band that when he died, he had Taproot's demo in his CD player. In 1988, Lane Staley met Demery Poirot, a model who would eventually become a grunge icon. Demery had a look that seemed to define the musical era, beautiful in a small-town way with her bright eyes, round cheeks, and curly hair. According to Alice in Chains' The Untold Story, it was love at first sight. The two soon became engaged, but eventually broke up around 1994. By then, Demery had also become addicted to heroin. On October 29, 1996, she passed away due to inflammation of the heart, caused by a previous overdose. When Alice in Chains' first bassist Mike Starr was hanging out with Staley the day before his death, the last time, as far as Staley's friends and family could tell, that anyone saw the singer alive, Lane revealed that he'd seen Demery recently in his apartment. The two were watching the show Crossing Over with John Edward, in which a medium claimed to speak to audience members' dead relatives oh, when Staley said, Demery was here last night. I don't give a, a lot. if you even believe me or not, dude. I'm telling you, Demery was here last night. According to the untold story, Demery's mother Kathleen Austin has heard Mike Starr's story and believes her daughter visited Staley, quote, to be there with Lane as he's doing his transition. Original Alice in Chains bassist Mike Starr spent the day before Lane Staley's death, Starr's birthday in fact, hanging out with the singer at his university district apartment. The interaction was mixed. According to David DeSola's book, Lane was in a sour mood and got into an argument with Mike. How many albums did they have? Because like I said, I grew up in this during this time and I know the name Alice in Chains. They were huge at the time, but it wasn't and very rare because I'm really into music and a wide variety of music. So I tend to get tapped into something, whether it's from a friend or radio or whatever. Yeah. Luckily for me in this channel, I totally missed them. So, yeah, how many albums did they have? It seems like it couldn't have been much because it kind of hit and then they just, he kind of tailed off. Although, made it to 2000, so maybe, I don't know. I need to do a documentary, don't I? Answer my own damn questions, huh? Mm? Over his use of benzodiazepine, perhaps the most tragic part of this was that the bassist, worried by Staley's appearance, tried to call 911 for his friend, but the singer declined. Speaking during a February 2010 episode of Loveline, Mike said, I was with him all that day on my birthday trying to keep him alive. I even asked him if I could call 911, you know, and he said that if I did, he'd never talk to me again. Of course, I didn't know he was going to die, or I would have called 911 anyways. I'd much rather have him alive and not talking to me than to have lost such a great human being a great friend, right. and just a great person. What a great person he was. Lane Staley's official date of death was declared April 5th, 2002. However, his body wasn't discovered until April 19th, two weeks after the singer had passed away from an overdose of cocaine and heroin. Wow. According to Seattle Weekly, police were forced to break down Staley's door after his mother called them to his university district apartment. The scene they found there was a harrowing one. Brown heroin stains leading to the bathroom to the living room, stashes of cocaine and crack pipes around the house, the TV on and flickering. Staley's body was sitting upright on his couch. His 6'1 body weighed only 86 pounds, and in one of his hands was a loaded syringe. A toxicology report found that he had morphine, codeine, and cocaine in his bloodstream. His death was ruled accidental. 
Lane Staley was the ultimate example of a rock and roll tragedy. I mean, his heart, there's nothing. You're, he's all over the place <laughs> with everything. He, yeah, his heart is like, you know what? I'm done. Ugh, that's tragic. A star whose incredible talent and creativity was cut short by an addiction that eventually grew out of his control. But somehow, out of Lane's story grew a bloom of hope for artists in the same position. According to the Seattle Times, shortly after Staley's death, his mother Nancy began receiving donations and letters from fans all around the world struggling with addiction. She was quick to note, I don't have any magic answers, I just try to console people. She started the Lane Staley Memorial Fund, a way to help those dealing with addiction to pay for treatment services. According to Therapeutic Health Services, which runs the organization, Nancy sees the fund as a means of partnering with Lane on the next step in his work. He was very honest with people about the effects of drug use, urging them not to follow in his footsteps. Those were the messages in his songs, endearing him to his fans. I think releasing the dark side, releasing depression, frustration is what we're all about. If you or someone you know is struggling with addiction, please call the Substance yeah. Abuse and Mental Health Administration's 24-7 National Helpline at 1-800-662-HELP. That's 1-800-662-4357. Interesting story. And like I just said, uh, mental health and drug issues are cousins in hell arms arms cousins and arms in hell um so yeah i figured that he had some sort of mental some mental issues as well because it's got to be a reason why you're starting the drugs to begin with them many times and many times you're doing it to escape it's that's a sad story but luckily his mother is trying to make a, help other people with their issues sometimes it's the person that you help um that can really you know bring you peace from the tragedy that you have to deal with you know uh anyway that was a great documentary and uh i'm more interested in alice in chains so uh look out for some alice in chains reactions how about that also have some more reactions if you'd like to take them out look at them check them out enjoy like and subscribe Rawr!